With the release of the Wii, Nintendo began to experiment with new forms of gameplay that took advantage of motion controls, resulting in a slew of titles for their flagship series centered around the Wii Remote with detailed motion and pointer-based control schemes. It seemed like an era when Nintendo would try any idea if it made sense for the console, but interestingly, Paper Mario wouldn't follow this trend. The sequel to Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door was vastly different from its predecessors, but not because it added motion controls. Instead, it changed the dynamic of the gameplay entirely, moving away from the turn-based RPG combat and 3D exploration in favor of a 2D side-scrolling platformer with lighter role-playing elements. It was a bold move for Nintendo and Intelligent Systems to switch up the gameplay just three games in, and one that wasn't popular with some of the fans, but still, the game managed to find an audience. It received generally positive reviews and sold very well, and actually remains the best-selling Paper Mario game to date, likely at least partially due to the huge success of the console itself. And today, we're gonna look back on the first game to shake up the core gameplay of the Paper Mario series and see how well it holds up today. This is Super Paper Mario. After Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door, Ryota Kawade wanted to make something different for the next Paper Mario game. He came up with the idea of Mario switching from 2D levels into 3D levels on a whim, giving the designers plenty of ideas for new puzzles. The team realized that switching the genre to a 2D platformer would fit this mechanic better, and thus the game pushed away from 3D exploration. This was partially inspired by the Bowser sections from Thousand Year Door, which players had responded positively towards and gave the developers the idea to move towards 2D in the first place. To this end, they looked back on Mario's old-school platforming adventures when developing the gameplay, blending it with some RPG elements from previous Paper Mario titles. Keeping those elements was critical for helping fans of the series ease into the new gameplay style, and Kensuke Tanabe, a producer on the game, also argued for the story to still have the depth expected of an RPG. This included character designs that were different from those seen previously, but that still had a Mario-esque look to them, leading to one of the more unique looks for NPCs in the Mario franchise. The game was initially in development for the Nintendo GameCube and set to launch in 2006, but at some point, development shifted onto the Wii and the game was retrofitted to fit the new hardware and controller. The GameCube version used nearly all the buttons on the console's controller, but Intelligent Systems managed to adapt the game for the Wii Remote along with no motion controls beyond pointing at the screen. The game launched in April 2007 in Japan and North America, the first Mario game released for the Wii in both territories, and then in September of the same year for Europe and Australia. While it did receive some criticism from fans and critics for dropping many RPG mechanics, it was nonetheless praised for its story, graphics, and originality, and many still consider it a worthy entry in the series. But you're all here to hear what I have to say about it, so let's take a deeper look into Paper Mario's 2D adventure. Super Paper Mario begins with a familiar premise, Mario and Luigi sending off to Bowser's castle to rescue Princess Peach. Once they arrive, they learn that Peach was captured not by Bowser, but by a man named Count Black, who knocks Mario unconscious and sends Luigi, Bowser, and Peach into a dimensional rift. The three are transported to another dimension where Count Black forces Bowser and Peach to marry, which summons an object known as the Chaos Heart as foretold by a book of prophecies known as the Dark Prognosticus. With the power of the Chaos Heart, Count Black summons the Void, a dimensional black hole that, if the Dark Prognosticus is to be believed, will eventually consume and destroy all worlds. As for Mario, still in Bowser's castle, he's woken up by a pixel named Tippy, who transports him to a world known as Flipside. There, a wizard named Merlin shows Mario the Light Prognosticus, another set of prophecies that indicate that Mario is the hero who will destroy the Void and save every dimension from destruction. To do this, Mario and Tippy will need to collect the Pure Hearts in order to counteract the power of the Chaos Heart, and thus Mario sets off on his journey to stop Count Black and his minions. Already you can see how Super Paper Mario puts more attention into its story, as the first 15 minutes are already loaded with new characters and darker overtones. We'll do a full examination of the narrative later, but for now, let's talk about the changes to the gameplay. 
Super Paper Mario goes back to Mario's roots, going from the 3D platforming and turn-based battles of the first two games to a 2D side-scroller with some action RPG elements. While you've been stripped of the hammer, at least initially, jumping is still a critical tool for getting around levels and dealing with threats. Jumping is very floaty, as Mario can reach incredible heights compared to what he could do in previous Paper Mario titles and, hell, even most of Mario's traditional platforming adventures. That, and the overall faster running speed, makes the movement feel more action-packed and hectic, an appropriate choice considering the platforming gameplay is much more of a focus here. Because this game wasn't moved onto the Wii until late in development, only a few functions were given motion controls, most notably scanning objects with Tippy by pointing with the Wii remote. Battles aren't on a separate screen anymore, instead, fighting enemies behaves like it would in a normal Mario game, with real-time combat where you jump on enemies or use other resources to take them down. Every enemy has different tactics needed to beat them, and since Mario and company gain a lot of tools throughout the game, including the various pixels and items you can pick up, there's still some variety in the combat. While the gameplay was severely overhauled, some elements from previous entries like stylish moves and leveling up return here. Leveling up happens when your score meter, which increases for every enemy killed, reaches a certain value, at which point you alternatively receive more health or more power to your attacks. So in essence, Super Paper Mario is an action platformer with light RPG mechanics, not a bad direction for the series to take in concept. The unification of combat and platforming, however, is not smooth. The controls are fine enough for getting across platforms, but when you're fighting enemies in terrain primarily designed for challenging platforming rather than combat, Super Paper Mario can sometimes be downright uncomfortable to play. The main issue is the knockback, something I never expected to see in a 2D Mario platformer and something that is infuriating to deal with, especially when you have enemies near an edge you need to jump onto. In this case, it's both the knockback you receive after jumping on an enemy, which can sometimes fling you in unpredictable directions, and after getting hit, which locks your character into a trajectory for a short time. The game doesn't have lives, and save points are frequent enough, so the game isn't necessarily punishing, but it can be very frustrating to fight against enemies. And that's just the beginning. Throughout the game, you'll encounter a number of Pixels, the sprite-looking creatures who help you with battles, puzzles, and or navigating through levels once you find them. Each one has a unique ability, such as Boomer, who turns into a bomb, Carrie, who uh, carries you across dangerous floors, and Kudge, who grants you back the hammer ability. As replacements for the partners of previous games, I find the pixels lacking in both gameplay potential and character development. Since each pixel only has one function, they don't have as much depth in combat and puzzle solving, although this is more a limitation of the genre since there isn't a need for multiple abilities for each character. But as for their character traits, well, they barely have any. Besides Tippy, every pixel gives a little speech when you collect them, and then afterwards, they don't say a single word. For the brief time they do speak, we don't really learn anything about them besides their basic personality, and they can be entertaining, but it's nowhere near enough to make them worth talking about. Not every partner in the previous games was interesting or had a good storyline, but I can at least remember what each of them are like. And where the main story here is otherwise well developed, the lack of any major character in the Companions is a missed opportunity. Tippy is the sole exception, and she is very intriguing and investing as a character, but more on that later. Mario and the Pixels aren't alone on their journey, however, as you can play as a quartet of playable characters this time as you recruit them through the adventure, each having their own special techniques. Mario is still your main man for most of the game, and with him, you can flip into the third dimension at any time, showing what the stage looks like from a different perspective. This is used to find hidden objects and passageways, which are otherwise inaccessible through the two-dimensional view. It's a cool concept on paper, no pun intended, but in practice? Ugh. You only have a limited amount of time to explore the third dimension before Mario takes damage, upon which the meter instantly refills, and honestly, having this timer at all is just confusing to me. It's very unlikely to actually be a hindrance because the rate of damage over prolonged use is slim, but it disincentivizes you from flipping into 3D mode if you don't realize this, which I didn't until late into the game. So the timer puts unnecessary stress that gives you no reason to stay in flip mode for an extended amount of time, and when you're looking for something that you can't see in 2D, that can mean a long time searching. 
I have no problem with the mechanic having a time limitation, but when you have areas built around using an ability for a long time and simultaneously punish the player for doing so, there's a problem. The other characters can't flip into 3D, but they have their own platforming and combat skills that either help travel to different parts of the level or provide a unique advantage against enemies. Peach can use her parasol to float across large gaps and can also defend herself with it, and Luigi can charge up a super jump that lets him soar vertically into the air, both of which are necessary for reaching certain areas, but are somewhat unwieldy or impractical for combat. Bowser, on the other hand, has the worst mobility, but deals double damage and has a fire breath attack that deals with threats at long range, making him my top choice for bosses as he can take them down almost instantly. Despite how useful some of these characters can be, I rarely find myself using anyone besides Mario, again because of that flip mechanic. Seeing as how it's a major crux of the gameplay and Mario's the only one who can use it, sticking with anyone else beyond the times where you need them feels like you're limiting yourself. But okay, I've been fairly negative so far and I haven't even gotten to my main problems yet, so let's switch to talking about something I actually like about this game, and that's the aesthetics. Just in terms of the level of detail, it doesn't look that much improved over Thousand Year Door, but it doubles down on making areas stand out with different art styles and themes for each location. Like the last game, some areas fall more in line with traditional Mario and platforming level concepts, while others are more beautiful and serene, especially with the hub world and the last two chapters. Those two chapters especially look absolutely wonderful, emphasizing darker colors and minimalist design that demonstrate a less lively and comforting atmosphere, a nice touch given their role in the story. It's sometimes weird to juxtapose the Mario crew into those locations since they tend to stick out, but that's more an observation than a criticism. But on the topic of character design, that's a bit of a mixed bag for me. I can't say I'm a fan of the look of the NPCs, their geometric based designs just don't do it for me because it makes every character look the same. This was a problem with the other two games as well, but considering these NPCs have a more unique art style, I find it more of an issue with this game. Thankfully, this isn't a problem for the important characters who have more attention to detail to help them stand out, though it probably helps that you spend a lot more time with them. The villains especially look incredible, with a balance between intimidating features and humorous facial expressions that combine with their fun and deep personalities to make some truly memorable bad guys. The soundtrack by Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn composers Naoko Mitomi and Chika Sikigawa and WarioWare sound designer and composer Yasuhisa Baba is another good listen. It feels like a natural evolution of the soundtrack of the Thousand Year Door, embracing weirder melodies and chord progressions that may sometimes be off-putting, but also makes for an enjoyably eclectic soundtrack. Not every song works for me, but I can appreciate how the composers stuck with their guns and tried a number of different styles and tones to create pieces with a wide variety in how they sound. There's no specific battle theme this time around, but the boss battle tracks are a highlight and help set the mood for the encounter, not necessarily threatening, but more energetic or heart pounding for sure. Unfortunately, the high marks of Super Paper Mario, which are definitely things I appreciate mind you, only serve as distractions to me from the main problem with the game. The chapters just aren't very fun. In this regard, it comes down to two issues, the level design and the individual stories of each chapter. The design of each area is very blocky, with no variances in the angle of the terrain, making every place look unnatural, as if they're not real locations, but more like virtual simulations. It almost seems like the designers were trying to capture the style of retro video game levels with grid-based level construction, especially with how many levels are laid out in long, extensive corridors. And no, this isn't a universal problem, for many of these levels, that retro level design just doesn't work because it goes against the explorative nature of the game and its puzzles. 
2D Mario level design is extended horizontally because you're only expected to go in one direction, and even when games allowed you to travel back through a level, it usually wasn't necessary to beat the game. But in some areas, whether because of intentional level progression or the nature of figuring out puzzles, you'll be moving back and forth between locations fairly frequently, and it's aggravating. Despite the flipping mechanic, levels are still mostly built horizontally, so there isn't any real depth to these places, and that goes a long way in making levels that are engrossing to explore. I'm not saying I need a world to be in 3D to absorb me into the game, but so many times I was taken out of the experience in Super Paper Mario because I was distracted by how the level was made. And of course, the inner chapter backtracking is here yet again, and while I don't think there's as many examples of backtracking here, the ones in this game are much more egregious and painful. Again, the level progression is the contributing factor, as the chapter's quest might require you to travel between ends of the level for arbitrary reasons. Maybe it's because I was already not a fan of this game when these issues really started to rear their head, but it's something I couldn't help but be more bothered with compared to the previous games. And now we come to discussing the story, and I want to split this into two parts, the stories of each chapter and the overarching narrative, as I have wildly different opinions on both. I will go on record right now to say that Super Paper Mario has the best story in the franchise so far, with the most interesting villain than main companion, but also a lot of quirky humor that helps lighten things up. When designing the dialogue, the writers focus not just on drama and character development, but on adding tons of weird, abstract jokes that can often catch you off guard in the best way possible. Previous games were funny, but Super Paper Mario was more in your face about it, and even though not every bit of humor may land, odds are a majority of it will get a chuckle out of everyone. I want to stress, however, that I'm only talking about the dialogue and not some of the gameplay elements that they threw in, I assume just because someone on the dev team thought it was a funny idea. Looking at you, Bakkursia, this enemy will send you back to the hub world if it damages you, which forces you to start the chapter over again. It's a good thing these things only appear early on in a chapter, otherwise they'd be much more of a nuisance. The real problem is that the stories of these worlds, while sometimes intriguing, are typically overshadowed by all the problems I mentioned earlier and don't give me enough reason to care about what's happening. How a level is designed and built can go a long way in making the story of that level enjoyable, and Super Paper Mario makes some very questionable and frankly ridiculous choices with the construction of its chapters that actively prevent the story of that region from getting in the spotlight. The hub world is the realm known as Flipside, a town that exists between dimensions that, just like before, is chiefly here to give Mario and company the ability to unlock new worlds by placing pure hearts they find into these heart pillars located around town. For the most part, I don't mind Flipside as a main area, and I actually really like the simplistic white color design of the top floors. I do find it to be too big, with a number of floors to explore, each containing a number of corridors, pathways, and buildings, not to mention a mirrored version called Flopside that doubles the size of the world. Often the key to knowing where the next heart pillar is requires memorizing the location of one obstacle in the corner of one of these floors, and considering how huge the map is, that can mean a lot of walking. I would call it unbearable, except once you do turn in a pure heart, you can use your return pipe to instantly warp back to Flipside Tower where the level entrances are, cutting back on backtracking significantly. Chapter 1 takes Mario to Line Land, a grassy hills area that takes you over a mountain and then into the Yold Desert, where Mario must find a pure heart inside the ancient Yold Ruins. This is far from the worst chapter in the game, but the level design in this chapter is generally very flat, making progression feel more unrewarding. Lineland Road and the Old Desert are especially guilty of this, and again, I know it's harkening back to old school platforming with this elongated level design, but if the level isn't fun to explore, it isn't fun to explore. The second chapter is thankfully better, as while the opening stage, Gloam Valley, suffers from the same problems, the rest of this section is a good time and features levels designed around exploration. You enter Myrtle's mansion, which has been taken over by one of Count Black's henchmen Mimi, who tricks you into collecting debt that Mario and company needs to work off through slave labor. That's honestly a great premise right there, especially when Mario games the system by exchanging secrets with fellow indebted prisoners of the mansion to pay off his debt faster. The final boss of this chapter even takes place inside a bathroom, which may be a more crass setting for a climactic fight, but it's also, weirdly enough, one of the more unique boss rooms I've ever seen. Chapter 3 features a land inspired by classic video games and goes back to the linear level construction in addition to throwing in a largely vertical level, which, as I've said numerous times on this channel, I don't like. 
Especially in a game like this, with knockback that makes it very likely that you'll fall down to a lower section if you get hit near the edge of a platform. I like how this world looks overall though, and the boss of the world, Francis, is a very interesting character to say the least. He's a parody of nerd culture and internet fanboys who hits all the tropes, obsessing over media, arguing about said media online, displaying a huge collection of memorabilia, and not knowing how to talk to women. I was really worried that this character would be hard to swallow looking back, but I actually find him weirdly prescient in that his attitude continues to exist today, especially in the era of social media. Some of his dialogue reeks of trying to write internet slang and never quite getting it though, and considering how fast memes become irrelevant, Francis is, in some ways, very dated. I may have had my problems with some of the previous worlds, but Chapter 4 is where they really start to get annoying, in this case because there's a large number of additional gimmicks that make these levels infuriating. Two stages feature shoot 'em up gameplay, which isn't terrible to control, but the lack of gravity and loose steering makes it difficult to make precise movements, which can be an issue when you're trying to hit specific targets. The second level goes back to the platforming, but with low gravity, which I don't mind, but it feels slower overall, making it more aggravating that you're forced to go through it both forwards and backwards to beat it. And then you're forced to go through this confusing mess of an area where you can shift gravity into one of four directions, which is a cool idea, but just not executed well with this maze-like level. The only thing I like about this chapter is that it introduces us to Mr. L, a mysterious person who reminds me of somebody, but I'm not sure whom. I don't have a lot to say about Chapter 5 other than the fact that it's boring and very perplexing to navigate through. Its story about a war between a society of cavemen and a race of flower people just never really connected with me, and I don't feel the need to repeat my complaints about the level design again. There are some standout moments, like I do remember the Caveman TV host Flint Cragley being funny, and I did enjoy ripping out chunks to shreds in the final area, but otherwise, not much here to talk about. Chapter 6. Oh boy, Chapter 6. This chapter takes place in the Samur's Kingdom, a world inspired by feudalist Japan where Mario and the gang are tasked with fighting through 100 warriors to prove to King Samur that you're worthy. Yep, the initial quest here is to complete 100 fights back to back, and man, realizing that that was what this chapter was about might have convinced me to walk away from this game entirely if I wasn't playing it for this video. Now, for plot reasons, you're only actually doing 20 fights, as the world is in danger of collapsing by this point, and the fights themselves, at least the ones you face during the story, are piss easy thanks to Bowser. But that doesn't erase the fact that you're just moving from one identical room to another, fighting characters with only minor differences over and over and over and over again. Eventually, the world is consumed by the void and the dimension is now a deep vacuum of empty space where the heroes go to retrieve the petrified pure heart after taking on Mr. L once again. The game builds up this reveal as a tragedy that will be the fate of all worlds if Mario fails, but since this is a loss of a wholly uninteresting dimension whose existence in the storyline is baffling, it just doesn't work for me. An entire world is devastated and I don't care. At least Chapter 7 is more visually and thematically intriguing, taking place in part of this universe's afterlife, a dark yet simultaneously serene world known as the Underwear. And yes, it's a name you can really only take seriously when it's written in text and not spoken. This is the place where people go when they die, or get a game over as it's called, and at first, Mario is transported here to rescue Luigi, which takes him through the Underwear Depths, a decently fun location to explore. The major plot involves heading into the heavenly side of the afterlife, the over there, bringing back that vertical level design I love so much. Climbing up the over there is basically just scaling a giant ladder of clouds with no real interesting set pieces between them until you reach the upper layers where the final areas reside. But what somewhat redeems this chapter is the reason why you're going to the over there and the twist at the end. The ruler of the underwear, Queen Jades, asks you to bring her daughter Lovebe to her home in the Over There, where she meets up with her father, King Gramby, after the crew fights the dragon monster Bonechill. It's then revealed that Lovebe is one of the pure hearts, transformed by her parents in order to hide her from Bonechill, a fate that Lovebe never wanted and makes her resent her parents for keeping her original form a secret. It's actually an interesting twist because it creates a conflict that feels like it means something, giving personality to what have up to this point been nothing but MacGuffins and investing you into the character's arc. 
Now, normally I'd talk about the side content in the game before moving on to discussing the final chapter, but cards on the table, I didn't do most of it and it's barely worth talking about. I'm not interested in collecting capture cards or playing games in the arcade or doing the returning Pit of 100 Trials, though I will say I dig the game and watch art style of the Pit this time. Instead, I'd rather talk about two major characters of the story, Count Bleck and Tippy, who provide a deep and emotional backstory that becomes a center point of the narrative. Tippy was originally a human girl named Timpany, who one day met an injured man named Blumier and nursed him back to health. Blumier was a member of the Tribe of Darkness, a group of magic practitioners who splintered off from the Ancients, a race of beings only mentioned in the game and never seen directly. The Ancients were the ones responsible for creating the Pixels from the souls of the deceased and using them to build their society, but the Pixels eventually tried, and failed, to start an uprising in defiance of this fate. A survivor of this conflict learned the truth about Pixels and escaped with the Dark Prognosticus, eventually forming the Tribe of Darkness. Lumiere is forbidden to marry outside the tribe as dictated by their laws, but he and Timpani keep meeting with each other and soon fall in love despite the disapproval of Blumier's father. Lumiere soon proposes to Timpani and she accepts, but when his father catches wind of this, he makes Timpani disappear to somewhere where Blumiere can't find her, making him believe she is lost forever. In despair, he adopts the name Count Black and resolves to destroy every world and dimension, as he has no more room for compassion in his heart and wishes death upon everything in return. Timpani, however, is alive and wakes up in Flipside greeted by Merlin, who transfers her soul into a pixel's body to save her life, and thus Tippy is born, with no memory of who she was. Over the course of the game, as Tippy and Count Black discover their shared past, the two come to doubt their current actions and whether or not one side must win over the other. Count Black begins to wonder whether or not destroying the world will really bring him happiness, and Tippy realizes that saving the universe means defeating and potentially killing the man she loved. Without a doubt, it's the most heartfelt story in the Paper Mario series so far, and one that is compelling even if the rest of the game isn't. Though the backstory is mostly conveyed through text between chapters, it gives the main companion and one of the main villains actual weight, which is fairly rare for this series. Paper Mario characters are primarily designed to be entertaining, and the dialogue is often most important, but for Tippy and Count Black, they have areas that develop as the game progresses and plenty of hidden motivations. I sort of skimmed over the backstory, but even just on a surface level, these two characters make the narrative work for me, and it's because of that that I'm willing to forgive some of the problems with the stories of each chapter. It also leads to a final area that, even if gameplay-wise it retains many of the same issues, is still a decently satisfying conclusion. And I mean this chapter is occasionally a terrible slog, with some of the most illogical and irritating puzzles in the game, especially with sections that revolve around the use of the flip mechanic. After battling Count Black, he begs the heroes to end his life despite Tippy's protests, but at the last minute, Black is attacked by one of his underlings, Dementio, though Black's assistant Nastasia takes the hit. Dementio has secretly been working to ensure that Count Black destroys the world so he can use the Chaos Heart for his own agenda, and when Black refuses to follow through with his plan, Dementio reveals his true colors. He brainwashes Luigi, turning him back into Mr. L, because surprise, it was Luigi all along, and merges the two of them with the Chaos Heart to form... this thing, Super Dementio. Mario defeats Dementio, thanks to Black and Tippy intervening, but the Void has grown so strong that it threatens to destroy the world at any minute, so Black and Tippy declare their love for each other, which creates another set of pure hearts, bringing balance back and stopping the Chaos Heart. The heroes and Black's followers awaken in Flipside, but Black and Tippy are nowhere to be found. With the world saved, the heroes begin a well-deserved rest, and Black's minions promise to help undo the damage done to the dimensions, and an image in the credits shows Blumier and Timpani alone on a grassy hill. After everything the game throws at you and all the hardships you have to endure, it is nice to see it does provide a satisfying payoff to the poignant storyline and character development. And again, it helped me see through to the end of a game that was otherwise tedious and frustrating. Okay, if it wasn't obvious enough already, I did not enjoy Super Paper Mario. Many of its ideas are sound, and I can appreciate how intelligent systems wanted to try something different, and in fairness, I do think the storytelling, graphics, and sound are well done. 
Unfortunately, there's just too many gameplay and design problems for me to overlook, and while the concepts Super Paper Mario presents are okay, the execution is severely lacking or has serious issues. I don't mind that Super Paper Mario switched up the gameplay, or that the series wouldn't return to the turn-based RPG style of the first two games from here on out, so long as the gameplay is well crafted. The 2D side-scrolling gameplay just doesn't work here thanks to the backwards level design and poor integration of movement and combat. In Super Paper Mario, the platforming isn't fun, and for a Mario game, spin-off or otherwise, that's a cardinal sin. I know this game has its fans, and hey, if you like this game, then more power to you. I hope you at least understand why I can't get into it and view it as significantly weaker than its predecessors. But Super Paper Mario was also the game that marked a shift in the series, one that signified the end of the RPG era and the beginning of what some call Paper Mario's downfall. And if this game bothered some fans with its different gameplay, the next one would alienate them entirely. 